um, somebody addressed me as doctor. That is absolutely not necessary. Uh, among white people to be called auntie is a much greater honor. Uh, I, I want to start. We had a beautiful opening ceremony, but I still want us to kind of center a little bit by uh, inhaling all the goodness that's inherently in the environment and breathing out all the junky stuff that may have accumulated today or last week or in the last 10 years or whatever that kind of will will or perhaps may uh, influence our ability to listen and to absorb and to be present. So what we do is we hanumai kapono through our nose, we inhale the goodness that was naturally and is naturally in, in the earth, in the environment. And then we're gonna exhale through our mouth, everything that needs to come out. <laughs> Ma kau kau, are we ready? Here we go. Hanumai kapono. Anuaku in a mea pono ole. Read it out. Hanumai kapono. Hold it. Ah, Hanuaku in a mea pono ole. Hanaho, one more time. Hanumai kapono. Anuaku in a mea pono ole. And finally, one more time. Hanumai kapono. Hold it. Thank you. And uh, this type of deep breathing is a traditional Hawaiian way of just centering ourselves. Uh, I want to start with a protocol, traditional Polynesian protocol, which acknowledges first whatever the highest power, the highest deity that you believe in, work our way down from the ancestors to the leaders, in this case of Hawaii, but also of of the entire world that are good leaders because we have a lot of junk leaders too as we all know these are the good leaders these are the leaders that take care of the people they take care of the environment and they take care of the spiritual world and then we want to greet the elders we want to greet the adult generation and then every living being within the sound of my voice no matter where you are all of those living beings that are around you from the spider that may be sitting on the wall to the plants outside of your window. All of those are the multitudes. They're all included in my greeting. Aloe na kubuna, aloe na makua, aloe kale hulehu, aloe greetings and love to all of you, all of us. I'm it's, we are very inclusive. Uh, the next chant is a centering chant, and it's basically acknowledging that there's knowledge all around us and that there's knowledge that comes from very, very ancient traditions and practices and understandings. And that's the knowledge that we're asking for during this time now, as I will share with you a little bit about what I've been up to in the last decade, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, this chant is done three times. So if you would like to chant along once I get to the second and third time, I invite you to, to do that and ask for this knowledge from above that's hidden in the wisdom of our chants, of our songs, of our stories, uh, and, um, and, and access it, right? Because it's, it's there, it's there for us. Our ancestors left it behind for us, not to ignore it, but to grow from it and to learn from it and to move forward and to advance that knowledge. Thank 
ke mailu na maie o na me a huna no e o na me li e ho mai e ho mai e ho mai Kaike mai luna mai e O na me ahuna no e au o na me li E ho mai e ho mai e ho mai Thank you. O ku hina hina kui kaha kai kaha kalau ko inoa. My name is Ku hina hina kui kaha kai kaha kalau, and I was named after this plant that you see here on the right because when I was born, that was the color of my eyes. It literally means the gray one standing at the beach, and I do love the beach. So I come from Hawaii, and I will tell you a little bit about. The places that have shaped me into who I am, because rather than telling you, um, you know, my degrees or um, who I'm related to or whatever, uh, for us it's really important to acknowledge place, to acknowledge the environment that has shaped us. Nolela, o Honolulu ku u oneha now. I was born in 1960 when Honolulu looked like this. Um, o makua ku ukai. My ocean is Makua. This is on the island of Oahu, and this is where I learned how to feed myself off of the ocean. We used to camp uh, on this beautiful beach uh, on the west side of the island of Oahu, and we would lay our nets there, and we would catch fish, and we would um, with nets and with spears, and really begin to understand that the land and the ocean. Have always kept their promise to feed us, and now it's our turn to keep our promise to take care of the land and the ocean. O Hawaii ku umokupuni, my island is Hawaii. Uh, even though I was born on the island of Oahu and I lived there, I have lived in on Hawaii Island more longer than any other island since 1991. And it is the island that has shaped me. It is the island that my children and my grandchildren are born, and where we all live, and uh, also where my ancestors come from. O Kilauea ku Mauna, my mountain, my volcano is Kilauea. Uh, I am a Pele practitioner. Pele is our goddess of this volcano. Um, also, my great grandmother's name is Opu Pele. Uh, was、so、her last name,、uh, which means the 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 stomach, the belly of Pele, and our families are able to sense volcanic eruptions before they occur, in our stomach, in our gut. Ohamakua Kuumoku, my district is Hamakua, which is on the north、uh, east side of the island of Hawaii. O Waipio Kuu Avava, my valley is Waipio, very secluded、uh, rural area,、um, four wheel drive only to access the valley, and、uh, that's where I've raised my children, and that's where I'm now raising my grandchildren. That's where this pedagogy of Aloha was born in the early nineties. O Hilave Kuu Wailele. Hi'ilawe is my waterfall. From our land, we look straight into this waterfall, and it has been a healer for me. It has been an inspiration for me in terms of composing songs, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight to behold. Okahuehu kuumakani. My wind is the huehu wind. It's a strong, gusty wind, and I enjoy it because it gives me energy. Okawawahia kuuua, my rain is the wawawahia rain. Here in Hawaii, we have names for rains and for winds of every little area of land. And in 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 the valley of Waipio, 
this feral cutting rain. It cuts into the cliffs so that you have all these little waterfalls, not just this big one, but lots of little waterfalls when the Va'ava'ahia rains flow. And here's my family. Uh, for those who have known me for a while, uh, probably since the last time I saw you, I have four grandchildren now who are my pride and joy. I also have two daughters, they're both married now. And uh, those of you who know my husband, Nale, he sends his aloha to everybody. And it was because of my children that I really um, advanced uh, and did things that I maybe would not have done otherwise. I've been an educator since 1985. Um, I, I've been teaching Hawaiian language and culture and history in a public system uh, is where, how I started in 85 and realized almost immediately that first of all, the way I was taught in the College of Education didn't work at all with my Hawaiian students, and also slowly realized that the more Hawaiian, the more traditional I was uh, trying to teach, the better the students responded. And then when I had my own children in 93 and in 95, I said, I have to do something. I can't send them to what I call the belly of the beast um, because it wasn't working for our kids. And so we started our own um, Hawaiian focused charter school, the first Hawaiian focused charter school in 2000, when my youngest daughter was in kindergarten and my older daughter was in second grade. And from there, this pedagogy of aloha evolved. When I was working on my PhD, uh, my, my dissertation title was actually uh, uh, Kanuo Ka'aina, which means natives of the land from generations back, a pedagogy of liberation. Uh, since the 90s and I was younger and on fire and I said, okay, let's liberate ourselves from what's not working. But when I asked the children, so we had a K to 12 school, kindergarten to, to 18 years old about, um, when I asked any of them from the young ones all the way to the older ones, what's different about this school? Why are you coming to school now when you had 180 absences last year? How come you're not having any problems um, when last year, you know, you were in the principal's office, you got suspended 15, 20, 50 times, whatever. How come you're getting good grades now when last year you were flunking everything? Nobody mentioned liberation. Not one single kid mentioned liberation. But they all, in one way or another, referred to this concept of aloha, to compassion, kindness, and caring. And the kids told us, this is the first school where I feel that the teachers care for me. This is the first time I feel safe. This is the first time that a man told me I love you. Boys, 15 years old, um, you know, had never heard a man tell them I love you. And my husband, Nale, who still teaches at that school, ready to retire really soon, <laughs> i.e. next year, um, every single day when the kids leave, he tells them, Remember, aloha vaoya oi, remember I love you. And it's not just that he tells them I love you, but he shows them that he loves them. And sooner or later, I had to come to the realization, forget about liberation, nobody gives a rep about liberation. What the kids need is aloha. What the kids thrive on and what is the secret to success. And I don't think this only applies to Hawaiian children. I believe this applies to children and not only children, but people everywhere is that when you engage with them with kindness and compassion and caring, they thrive. And so I threw out the pedagogy of liberation and called it what the kids called it, which was a pedagogy of aloha. Now, in Hawaii, I don't know, probably other places of the world, the, the word pedagogy is not really a common word, right? Nobody knows what the hell pedagogy means. So we said, okay, let's simplify that and let's call it education with aloha because that's basically the same thing, right? I was in the, uh, at that time, my dissertation, I had to put the word pedagogy there, you know, but uh, for the common, for all of us, the word education with aloha, people understood that. And when we shortened that to ea, e -A, ea, pronounced ea in Hawaiian, just so happens ea means sovereignty or independence in Hawaiian. So we're right back to my liberation, but without having to put that as the front, because that's not 
the main thing. It will result in sovereignty and liberation. I have no doubt about that part, but it's about the, the key, the, the magic, the, the, the solution is aloha. That's what I feel um, very, very strongly. And I've, I've been uh, practicing it in so many different ways. As I said, since at least 2000 uh, and indirectly, probably earlier, just not explicitly and not intentionally, I guess. So they asked, so what is education with aloha? What is pedagogy of aloha? And we had to uh, condense it to a simple formula that people would get you know, in the elevator speech when we only had two minutes to explain it. And so we looked at, okay, what's the most important part about this education with aloha? Well, number one, and it has to be number one, is relation building. If we don't build relations with the people that we're teaching, again, regardless of age, regardless of ability, regardless of social economic status, whatever, whatever, if we don't build amicable relations of trust and of caring and of love, really, that's you know, that's what it's about, right? When 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 our students as teachers don't feel like they're loved, then we might as well go home already. We can do everything else. You can have the greatest technology, you can have whatever, you can take them on field trips, you can do any kind. If the relations aren't there and they don't feel like they're safe, they don't feel like somebody cares about them it's not going to happen. So spending a lot of time, not just five minutes with some <laughs> exercises the first week of school or whatever, but throughout the educational process of building and maintaining those relations is imperative. Once we have those relations established, the other thing that's really, really important is that whatever we're teaching has to be relevant, right? It, it has to make sense. Here in Hawaii, we're occupied by the United States since 1898. Um, that school system was taken over then. Our language was outlawed. My grandfather was beaten in school for speaking his own mother tongue. Um, the entire curriculum centers on the continental US. We don't know nothing about that and we don't care about the continental US. Not that they, they should care about it, just we don't care. We live on an island not on a continent. We have different traditions, we have different values, we have a different lifestyle, and that's what we need to be teaching our kids, not about some whatever stuff that is important to them over there. So relevant curriculum. And then the next part is, and that's the part that has been completely factored out, in my opinion, from Western education, is responsibility to the learning. This concept of we're learning for learning's sake, that's a bunch of crap for me, because why should I be learning for learning's sake? I should be learning so I do something with that knowledge to create a better world, right? To, to make positive change wherever I can. Um, that's my responsibility as a student, is to, um, to do something with my learning. And that's my responsibility as a teacher, is to make sure that my students understand that and that they practice that and that, that I practice it with them to, to be responsible for the things that they're learning. And when you do those three things, when you start with building strong relations, when you make sure what they're learning makes sense to them, whoever they are and whatever their life is, that it aligns with their way of life. And when you make sure that they understand that they have a responsibility, and not just to themselves, but to others and to the spiritual world and to the environment, you're automatically going to end up with what we would consider a rigorous education, meaning that it that it has value, that the kids get, or whoever it is, gets something out of it. And if you do it right, it should also be fun. Because if it's no fun, then it's certainly not Hawaiian education because we love to have fun. Fun is our favorite thing. And, and education should be fun. When we, we started, before we started a charter school, we had a school within a school. And our biggest criticism was, oh, you kids aren't learning anything. We had um, high school kids. And I who, said, why? Who, why? I'm, so, I'm so sorry to interrupt you just for one second. So we, we just activated the Spanish channel and um, uh -huh. our dear Eve is, is translating simultaneously into Spanish. If you could just go a little bit slower. She's okay. having trouble keeping up. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I apologize. All right. So relations plus relevance, right? Making it relevant 
plus responsibility uh, results in rigor, meaning that the education is valuable. And if we do it right, also in fun. And fun is so important because as I mentioned, when we were a school within a school in 1996, 97, 98, 99, all the way until we started our charter school, we were accused of not teaching our children. And when I asked those who criticized what we were doing, why they said that, they told us that when they went by our classroom, everybody was laughing. So our problem in their eyes was we were laughing too much. And those of you who come from indigenous cultures, you know, you can't laugh too much. It's impossible to laugh too much. And why shouldn't laughing be associated with learning, right? So that's something, again, the Western school system, when you're having fun, you can't learn, which is totally not true. So uh, today I will be sharing some proverbs, some Hawaiian sayings. We call them olelo no eao. And these are sayings that were passed down verbatim, meaning word for word, from generation to generation. And these proverbs, they really explain the values and the philosophies of our ancestors. And they have guided the behavior of our ancestors, and they still guide our behavior today. And we hope that they will continue to be guide the behavior of our children and grandchildren in the future. These uh, sayings or proverbs also help us to determine how to live as 21st century Hawaiians. So even though these sayings are a thousand years old and we are very blessed that we have a book, now it's an e-book as you can see here, that has over 3,000 Hawaiian proverbs and they're not just things that old people said, that my grandfather said, but these are wisdoms, words of wisdom that help us to figure out how to live today as modern Hawaiians. And ultimately, what they show us is that ancient is modern. One of these proverbs is a'ohe pau ka ike ikaha not all knowledge is contained in one school or one can learn from many sources. So I want to qualify that what I know is what I learned from multiple sources, but that I don't pretend to know everything for sure. And also don't pretend that, that my knowledge is the only knowledge uh, and this is the only way of doing it. There are many sources and what I am sharing with you today is what I've learned from my sources. The other proverb that I'd like to share is lehu lehu a mano mano ka ikena a ka Hawaii. Great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiians. This is an ancient proverb, thousands of years old, that made us realize when we found it in these books, um, in this specific book, that our ancestors were aware of their in-depth, incredible, infinite, actually greater numerous is not quite the right translation. That's how it's translated in the book, but these lehu lehu and manu manu are number words that actually mean infinite. That our native knowledge, and this is not just the knowledge of the Hawaiians, this is the knowledge of every indigenous people is great and numerous and infinite. And that it's that knowledge that will help us to thrive and I really believe it'll help the whole world to thrive if we understand, again, how our ancestors took care of themselves, their body. As you can see here, this is a, 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 a Hawaiian um, medicinal practitioner who uses medicinal herbs for healing. We have on the, on the top left somebody, they're setting bones, uh, people who are doing massage, all the, the, to keep our bodies healthy is something that our, that our ancestors already knew about. Um, that's just one tiny, tiny fraction of the knowledge of our people. But I believe that it's that knowledge that will help all, everybody to survive 
into the future. Now, here's a little comparison between what I call Western education, and you can call it whatever you want to, and Hawaiian education, which is also then can be expanded to indigenous education in general. And uh, I'm not necessarily going to go there and say one is bad and one is good, even though it's kind of true, <laughs> but they're certainly different, right? So in, in Western education, uh, which is what is being taught in our school system in Hawaii today, the teachers, the books, and now World Wide Web, the digital sources and resources, that's what's considered a source of knowledge. For us as Hawaiians, it's the people, especially the elders. It's nature, the environment, and it's the spiritual world as well. That's our sources of knowledge. So very, very different sources of knowledge. Where we learn is also completely different. Western education, they, they tie us to our chairs in our classrooms uh, all day long, kind of, yeah. Whereas for us, we love to learn in nature. We love to learn out in the real world, doing real things. Uh, as far as the formation of those who learn together in Western education, it's generally same age if you are, you know, in the primary system, and then sort of same age, you know, that between 20 and 30, that's when you go to the university. Whereas in Hawaiian education, it has always been a multi-age environment where the younger siblings learn from the older siblings, where there are elders involved, intergenerational kind of learning, and, uh, and everybody knows their roles. Everybody understands that if you're younger, you need to listen, you need to follow. If you're older, you need to protect, you need to nurture, you need to take care of. And it's a, it's a very different kind of learning environment that works so well uh, our, at our uh, charter school. Uh, the first project, when we first started, we had a K-12. So children from five years old to 18 years old were in one project learning together, and it was beautiful. The emphasis in the Western, not just education, but pretty much everything, is about individualism and invid individual achievement, right? It's all about me. These little girls wear these shirts where it actually says it's all about me. When I see that, I tell them, you know, little girl, this is not how it is. Um, for us as Native people, it's not important if you, in, if you achieve individually. What is important is that we all advance, that we all move forward, that we all progress. So the focus on collective achievement versus me, 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 is our way of life. Um, another way that is the diametrically opposed is our approach to how we teach something. So in a Western classroom, you know, let's say we have a science class and a guy, science teacher tells you about gravity or whatever it is, and there's all these formulas and the whole whiteboard or blackboard is full of whatever. And then there's, oh, I wanted to show you, wanted to do a, a practical experiment, but oh, ran out of time. Tomorrow we'll do something else. That's kind of how it happens a lot of times where there's just pushing, pushing all this theory that to many of us makes no sense at all. And then the practical part, we run out of time and it never happens. For us, we start with the practice. We show them, if you drop this thing on your foot, boom, you know, the higher you drop it, the more sore your foot is going to be, right? Something very <laughs> easy to, to get. And then we don't need to talk about the theory anymore because the kids already get that from the practice. This is a chunk in <laughs> uh, example. We actually don't drop anything on anybody's foot, but you get the idea, I hope. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this focus on learning for learning's sake, right? When you really have no idea why you should be learning this algebra or this, you know, physics stuff that you'll never use in your life, right? Why am I learning this? I don't know. We're here, we all, somebody said we have to learn it. That doesn't fly with us. We learn to create positive change. We learn to make the world a better world. We learn to help one another, to help the environment, and to make sure 
that things are porno or good, uh, that they are proper, that they are wholesome, I guess might be the best English words that I can think of for the word porno. So let's look a little bit about into what this traditional Hawaiian education resulted in and where the Western education has, has taken us. Um, our education at the time of first contact with the Westerners, they found a thriving 100% self-sufficient societies with exceptional general health and welfare and an abundance of food and water and happiness with laughter being heard everywhere. As I mentioned, since 1898, we've been occupied by the United States and have been under Western educational system. And that has resulted in us being the most under and uneducated major ethnic group in our homeland. We have the highest percentage of houseless. We don't call them homeless because Hawaii is their home. Nobody can take that away. The highest percentage of incarcerated or in prison the highest percentage of teenage pregnancies, and the list goes on and on and on. In fact, 57% of our people are currently economic refugees on the U.S. continent because we cannot afford to live in our own homeland as a result of Western education and economics. Our education was informal, personalized, relevant, place-based, project-based, values-based, fun, and rigorous, which are really all words that Western education talk about, but not really implement. At the same time, though, finally, you know, slowly, there is that acknowledgement that these are this is the way that we should be teaching today. So in that way, ancient is modern. So let me tell you a little bit. In 2015, my daughter and I attended the first global ecoversities gathering in Portugal, and we consider ourselves a founding member of the ecoversities alliance and are truly proud and grateful to be part of this beautiful, beautiful family of radicals, of change agents, of people who love the land, who love other people, and who acknowledge and respect the spiritual world. And so in 2000, we officially um, opened AI University, which again, AI standing for education with Aloha. COVID happened and we got slowed down. <laughs> we had to slow down a bit, but it's happening. So we have a tuition-free, culture-based, the Hawaii's first tuition-free, culture-based, post-secondary education and career training program for Native Hawaiians ages 15 through 30. Again, EA, Education with Aloha, is our pedagogical foundation. And as we all know, ecoversities are transformative learning spaces that are designed to cultivate human, cultural, and ecological flourishing, and that's what we want to do. In our case, we, we really uh, are radically reimagining higher education for Native Hawaiians. That's our focus, Native Hawaiians. We're transforming the current unsustainable and unjust economic, and political, and social systems and mindset that exist here in Hawaii as a result of U.S. occupation and reclaiming our own Native Hawaiian processes of learning and unlearning, of knowledge creation, and of community building. And we're nurturing this pedagogy of, uh, this ecology of pedagogy of aloha, and as a result, leading cultural and ecological regeneration here in Hawaii. We have, again, um, Hawaiian proverbs that guide us. Waola loko ike aloha. We acknowledge that aloha or love, caring, compassion, and kindness is imperative for Hawaiian kanaka is the Hawaiian word for us, call ourselves kanaka, for our own welfare. We also kulia ikanu. Our ancestors told us to strive to reach our highest potential, not so that we end up being great and people da da da. No, we reach our highest potential so that everybody benefits, right? Okapono kihana ia is another proverb that says continue to do good 
And that is one of our guidelines that whatever we do is guided by this concept of Pona, which I mentioned earlier, which is everything that is good and right from a Hawaiian perspective. And we constantly seek knowledge, which is called iimi ike. In fact, our learners are called iimi, which doesn't just mean seeking knowledge, but constantly seeking knowledge. That was a Hawaiian way of life in the past, and we want to continue that. Our people for thousands of years were seek constant seekers of knowledge. Aloha Aina, love for the land and the environment is also a very important part of our practices. And so we practice respect and loving caretakership of nature. It's about empowering our young Native Hawaiians um, to reach their highest potential, that's that kulia ikanu, so that they can contribute to the nation building. We are part of the Hawaiian sovereignty independence movement, so they can contribute to the building slash rebuilding of our Hawaiian nation, which was the first non-European, non-white, kingdom acknowledged by the world powers for all its worth. And that was in 1843. As I mentioned, the issue we have is that our young people are leaving our islands. We are the only ethnic group within Hawaii that where consistently more people leave, more Hawaiians leave than come back over the past 15 years. Um, we have uh, 83% of our people have no post-secondary degrees, which means they can't get jobs where they can feed their families. And over 50% of our young people or our families with young children earn below the living wage. And so the chance of young Hawaiians to uh, currently to earn sufficient income to live and raise their families in Hawaii is a 50-50. So if you have two children, chances are at least one of them is going to relocate to the continent and you will not see your grandchildren or you know great grandchildren unless you move there too which is also happening sadly and so we created these post secondary micro credentialing programs so we are an independent ecoversity we are not affiliated with any state or federal or anything government a Western government program that is specifically for Native Hawaiians, by Native Hawaiians. It's grounded in our traditional Hawaiian knowledge. It uses our own Native Hawaiian methods and practices, and it prepares young Hawaiians to thrive in 21st century Hawaii. So it's not like we want to go back to the 17th or 18th or 19th century. We know we are 21st century Hawaiians, but that doesn't mean we have to give up our values and our way of life. And what we want to do is contribute to a self-sustaining Hawaii, because right now, just using one example, 80 plus percent of our food is imported from somewhere else. When we could grow food 12 months out of the year, mostly what is grown is for export. And because of the long history of sugar, cane production, agriculture, our land is so polluted that uh, it's really hard, again, to grow food there um, because there was so much pesticides and insecticides used to sustain that sugar and pineapple industry. We have four major foundations. One is Kumupa'a, which is our Hawaiian language and culture foundation. And what that's about is all of our iimi, all of our learners, we want them to be able to live like a Hawaiian and to be Hawaiian, meaning they understand their culture and their language. They live Hawaiian values as a way of life. They practice cultural traditions, protocol and ceremonies. They're grounded in at least one traditional practice that could be fishing, that could be weaving, that could be chanting or dancing, but something where they're deeply grounded, where they become masters in that specific practice, and where they not only know how to speak Hawaiian, because right now only about 5% of our people are able to communicate in Hawaiian, because as I said, it was outlawed when the United States uh, occupied us. 
uh, but that aren't only able to speak the language, but prefer to converse in the language. So that Hawaiian again becomes our preferred language of communication. The second foundation is Mahi, which is the career exploration and training. And so we give, we provide hands-on career training through paid internships um, where they learn foundational work skills and attitudes. We help them create and maintain an e-portfolio to help them uh, get jobs or to apply for funding, et cetera. Um, also, we, as I mentioned, we uh, provide industry validated micro credentials. In other words, we ask other native Hawaiians who are experts in these fields to approve our micro credentials um, and then those are that that's the validation rather than university credits or you know ABC whatever. They also all have to create a pers a plan um, that will help them to reach their personal, their cultural, their career, and their life goals. And we help them develop that and then uh, help them to work towards that um, because it is we feel so much easier if you're your own boss in terms of practicing your values, taking care of the land, et cetera. We also have a strong Native Hawaiian entrepreneurship program that is not about making money, but that is about contributing to a sustainable Hawaii. Our third foundation is Aloha Aina, which literally translates to love for the land. And that is where they engage in hands-on land stewardship practices, uh, where they learn how to procure necessities from the environment, uh, all kinds of different things, where they learn how to grow their own food, uh, become knowledgeable about land stewardship from all the way from pre-contact to the 21st century, and where they um, practice how to contribute to a sustainable island economy and an eco-friendly world. And here is our outdoor learning laboratory. You see the waterfall right there. That is our land that we have. It's about five acres in Waipio Valley called Kapapalo'i o Keali Ikua Aina. Keali Ikua Aina is the middle name of my daughter Iini that some of you know. And um, her and her husband take care of that place. And Nale and I, her parents, <laughs> are there when we can and we help when we can. And what we do down in Waipio is we provide opportunities for our iimi, for our young people to learn from the environment. That is an important piece. One thing that is so, so beautiful about the environment, land, aina means all of that, is that the aina, the land, the environment does not discriminate. Aina does not care if you have money, doesn't care if you're beautiful, doesn't care if you're skinny or fat, doesn't care if you have a GPA or an IQ of whatever, right? Aina responds to your love for it with showing you it's or her, in our case, it's not a thing, it's a living being, right? It's our ancestor, actually, land is our mother. It responds with love uh, when it is given love, right? So if we take care of the land, the land takes care of you. And the only way that somebody can learn that is by being in the environment and taking care of the environment. And our final foundation is Olapono for healthy living. And so we really try to work hard with our young people, our iimi, uh, to take care of themselves and their families using both traditional and modern practices. Native Hawaiians died 10 years earlier than any other ethnic group in Hawaii. And so it's really important that they learn how to take care of their health. Uh, it also includes basic island relation building and survival skills, the knowledge of financial literacy as well, and a commitment 
to once again return to and contribute to a traditional gift economy. We have a blended curriculum where we have asynchronous online courses that can be accessed anytime, anywhere. We have personalized internships in the learners community so that they can stay at home because they can't afford to live anywhere else. We have culture-based mentorships, e-portfolios I already mentioned that attest to the skills and accomplishments of our students and can be accessed again, anytime, anywhere. And uh, their assessment is our performance-based assessments to authentic audiences, the way our ancestors assessed um, whatever we learned for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Here is our portal for our asynchronous courses. We call it AIA Education with, Alo Education with Aloha E-Learning. And um, it is a way for the students to access a variety of asynchronous courses that are bilingual in, at, at large, um, definitely uh, help them to grow their Hawaiian language skills, but also their knowledge of our history and uh, knowledge on, in this case, Ho'omakaukaukala on the right side here is about how to prepare taro. Um, those are the types of courses that we offer through our AI e-learning portal. Our first program that has just started in September, and it's, it's a two-year program that's going to continue to August 26th, um, is called Kanaka, which is the same word as Hawaiian. That's what we call ourselves, culinary arts program. So the emphasis here is not just for them to become chefs or to have their own lunch wagon or their own catering program, but that they cook with Hawaiian foods. And so here is our um, website for our Kanaka Culinary Arts Program. Here is our first group of interns um, who just started, as I said, they all got aprons, they got hats, they got knives, et cetera. And then here it explains a little bit about it. Um, there's asynchronous courses, there are internships, there are mentorships that they have to do uh, community service. They help us uh, with, with teaching how to cook in Hawaiian. And then at the end, they have to do a project demonstrating excellence um, at the end. Okay, now let me get back to my, oops, wrong one, sorry. Where are we? Yeah. Okay. Mm. One moment, please. All right. Uh, and so we are. We created this Kanaka Culinary Arts Diploma. It's a two-year culture-based micro-credentialing preparing young Hawaiians, and you saw who they are, right, a little while ago, for careers in Hawaii's food industry, with this special emphasis on using traditional ingredients, including taro, which is our main staple, staple as well as other locally sourced foods. Uh, and here they are again, uh, this group, and we are just so very, very proud of them. Um, they, that, that, that program started with a weekend internship, uh, where chefs came and showed them how to use knives. We, we gave each one of them a whole knife set and thermometers, uh, food thermometers and peelers and whatnot, aprons, as you can see, bags to put their knives in so they can take it on the plane. And then for the their, their project demonstrating excellence, which happens all the time, was to do a brunch for the community where every single dish, and these were all the dishes that were served at that brunch, had taro in it, because this first semester, their focus is on taro, which is our staple, as I mentioned. And so they created in, in three days, so they came on a Friday, the lunch the brunch was on Sunday, and it was incredible. Uh, the amount of learning that happened, and the amount of relation building that happened. As I mentioned, we also focus on Kanaka entrepreneurship. And here's uh, some of the students that are part of our uh, entrepreneurship program. Uh, we only did uh, just courses for now, but we're almost ready to launch that uh, as a program 
relatively soon. Um, we have mentors. So one program that we have is about weaving with pandanus. We call it lauhala. Pandanus is a tree that has these long leaves and we use it for to make baskets and hats and mats. Our sails traditionally were made out of pandanus. And um, here we have a, a, the lady in the hat. She's a mentor. She has been weaving lauhala pandanus for, I want to say, a good 40 years. And uh, the young man is is one of the uh, her. She's the mentor to that young man. And what what More they do a, is a, create este tools. And uh, so what this allows is for the mentors to share their cultural practices and expertise with our iimi, our learners, share their personal experiences but also to support the learners emotionally, to provide intergenerational experiences, to model our traditional values and our traditions, as well as link the learners to La the group. The idea de tener eh, lo, lo que llaman mentors. Perdón, Eve, you're out of the translation channel already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, sorry, Google. No, no, no problem, it happens. Um, the other part is that we're noticing that not just the IIMI, the learners are learning, but our mentors are also learning. So what we provide is opportunities for the mentors to learn it as well. So when we had this tool making workshop, we have uh, you know groups of about 10 uh, mentors, and then they all have one person who they teach a cultural practice uh, and, and uh, advance them in that culture mentor practice that they're also learning because many of them, for example, didn't know the Hawaiian words for the different parts of the plants. And so we're able to teach them as well. So these mentors can also become co-learners as we all advance together, in this case, in cultural practices, such as um, weaving with this um, leaf of the pandanus tree. As I mentioned, each um, learner, each IIMI has a personalized learning plan. And the first thing that we do is to find out what they already know and help them to validate that knowledge in their plan. And then using what they already know to build on and to advance. So rather than focusing on the deficits, we try to find out what it what is what are the learners passionate about what are their strengths and then we help them to advance those strengths um also obviously because many of them went through the western school system they have areas of improvement and we try to find them as well and the ones that we think are important that they don't know yet we help them to improve in those areas the main thing is to help our learners, our IIMI, to reach their highest potential, as I said, not just for themselves, but for their families, for our nation, and for the environment. And when things change, you know, somebody gets pregnant or somebody, whatever, you know, things happen, then we pivot and we allow them to change their plans as needed, because you can't just be rigid uh, about things like that. All of our learners have an e-portfolio, as I mentioned, and it starts out with a traditional Hawaiian introduction. Uh, this is my daughter, Iini. And again, just like I did my introduction, sharing with you the places that have shaped me into who I am, she starts her e-portfolio the same way with an introduction of the places that has shaped her into who she is. This is one of our learners and he, uh, you know, we, we do lots of, we, as a researcher, it's really important for us, especially since none of this has ever been done before uh, in Hawaii. You know, I know there's some awesome programs around the world that may be doing similar things, but we're definitely the first in Hawaii. And so we ask them for their thoughts. We ask them for their, to reflect on their experiences. And this young man who is 22 years old now, he said, AI University provides a perfect environment, professionalism, 
kuliana, which means responsibility, fun, and Hawaiian culture are blended together for a great experience. And that's really, that's the pedagogy of Aloha, right? It's the rigor that he started with that, even though to me, that's actually more of an outcome. Responsibility, we have that right here. Fun and Hawaiian culture, which includes responsibility and relevance are blended together. And that's that's really our objective. And we are continuing to work on that. What we really feel we can create is not just a win-win, but a win-win-win-win-win-win-win situation where um, our way of teaching and learning positively impacts our own youth and young adults. That's our primary focus, but also their families, uh, our communities, and our nation. It also helps us to revitalize and to advance our native language, our culture, and our traditions. It's helping us to take care of the environment, it's helping us to stimulate the Hawaiian economy, meaning that we're learning to work better together and return to this traditional way of gifting one another rather than paying one another. And in that way, it really, we hope, and I think it already is to a small extent, benefiting and having a positive impact on all of Hawaii. And to us, that's important because it's not just even about we want to thrive. Definitely, there's no doubt about that. But we don't want to do it at the expense of somebody else, even those who have overthrown our queen and who are occupying us. And so for us, our motto is when natives thrive, in this case, it's when Hawaiians thrive, but we believe that that's a true statement for all natives. Everyone benefits. And that's really, that's that win, 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 win. You know, if everybody can benefit, and that includes the environment, that includes the economy, that includes uh, people from other ethnicities that have made Hawaii their home, then I think we're on the right track. So what we are asking people to do is to invest in our youth. And when I give presentations, you know, I ask people to donate, uh, to hire an intern. That's That's our biggest challenge right now is to find the funds so that we can provide paid interns, uh, paid internships to all of our IIMI. Uh, as a new program, you know, it, it I've, I've started <laughs> all kinds of new programs. It's not easy because you don't have a reputation yet, right? We feel that once we, we are able to do one or two of these internships that we pay, um, then the employers will see the benefit of having our interns and pay them. But it's really hard to just go up, walk up to an employer and say, hey, I have this guy, I'd like you to hire him as an intern and can you pay him, you know? Um, so we're working on it. Um, and if any of you are interested in finding out what we're doing, we have a monthly newsletter um, that you can subscribe to on our webpage, www.kuakanaka.com. Kuakanaka means to stand as a Hawaiian, to live like a Hawaiian, or to be Hawaiian. And there we will share our latest updates and learning opportunities. Um, and again, so if you're interested, just go onto that website. And it, it the first thing that pops up is an opportunity to subscribe to our newspaper, newsletter. And if any of you are interested in, in uh, what we're doing and would like to be part of a committee or an advisory board, that is also an opportunity uh, because we really want to learn and we believe we can learn from many sources as I started at the very beginning. So my daughters are both part of this, uh, this effort. Uh, my younger daughter, she's the executive director of AI University and my older daughter and I have a social enterprise that is the economic driver for AI University. So we had to create that first so that we could make AI University a reality. And so I'd like to do my closing chat, but then afterwards I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers. Mahalo <laughs> 
Mahalo ina kuwa. Mahalo Mahalo and thank you very much for joining me today. So if anybody, I'm going to, uh, what did I left here? Just my contact information. Um, if anybody needs that, um, and again, uh, Kua Kanaka is the website for signing up for our newsletter. If you want to know more about AI Diversity, it's just forward slash AI Diversity.